Hello, innovators. I am Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. I am here today with St. Rappaport, relationship photographer and host of Life Picks Relationship Podcast. Thank you for coming on the Polymath Polycast. Hey, Dustin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, we were having some trouble beforehand. I mean, I was late today, so I'm so glad that you're still here and we we're able to have this great experience. It's super exciting. Yep, me too. I'm really excited for this. Please say hello to the innovators in the audience. Hey everyone. Hi, I am SD Rapport, and like Dustin said, a relationship photographer and host the Life Picks Relation- Re- Life Picks Relationships podcast. Yeah, it's a whole bumble oh. of words. Hello and welcome to the Polymath Polycast interviews and discussions. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad to be here speaking to you. Yeah, and we're going to be talking about relationships, self-development, and growth, and I think there's plenty of other topics we can go into as well, plenty of tangent bait, as you can say. So one way I like to break the ice is to have you share something about yourself that no one knows about you. No one knows about me. That Like, most people don't know that my favorite food is lettuce. Ooh, why lettuce? That's interesting. I just like it. It feels really clean when you eat it, and you just, like, eat tons of it, and, like, nothing. And, like, texture, I just... <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you can like add anything to it. So uh-huh. you get like all different flavors and tastes. Well, and spicy stuff with lettuce is always really good too. Yum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love spicy food. What's interesting is that texture does make a really big difference. Uh, for example, I would put like chips on a sandwich just to get that crunch. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> so go digging into the, some of the questions here. Um, how has being a relationship photographer developed your life decisions and your own relationships? Okay. First, I'm not in a relationship. And that is why I don't consider myself the relationship expert. Like Mm. on the relationship podcast, I don't say any advice or give anyone things. I might say something about life in general, but nothing about relationships. And instead, I pick the brains of my guests, the people that have extraordinary relationships and find out what makes their relationships so great and how everyone else could. So that's first. Now, how it has affected my life and changed my life. Well, first of all, I learned so much more about relationships and people in general. Mm -hmm. Because although I work with relationships like married people or at least in a committed relationship, there's so much there that could be related to everybody else. Like when you're communicating and being self-aware and just being there and giving in love languages and all those other things, it's not just with your partner. So I for sure change the way I act and react to people in general. I'm sure that it helps boost emotional intelligence as well, getting that constant stream of advice and feedback and just being able to reevaluate, oh, so this particular situation could have been handled differently with this new advice that I've been given. Yeah, yeah. And like, I'm not especially like intelligent and like book smart sort of thing. I consider myself more like, like you said, emotionally intelligent. So it's been extra, like even added even more because some things that other people don't pick up, I feel like I picked it up Mm -hmm. more than others. Like I could test things out purposely, not just like see afterwards, but I say, okay, so today I'm going to try this and see what happens. And then as long as there's no harm done, then it's cool to see what happens. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think you have to experiment with relationships. One of the things I actually started doing when I first got out of high school was when I got old enough to go to karaoke. And I went there to learn how to sing, but also to practice relationships because you have to try it out, see what works and doesn't work. And do you have any examples of when you've tried out different things? I think it was more like, okay, so if I try saying a sentence like this, what will happen? Because like, let's say a lot of people say, you know, like start the sentence with I instead of you. So that way you're taking it on yourself. So let's say the first time I heard that, I'm like, okay, so now I'm going to try this. But you could say an I sentence and then flip the second half of the sentence to the you. And many people do that because we're so used to doing you, even without saying the actual words you will say, but whatever, whatever. Now that has like led me to say okay so it's not just an i sentence it's the whole focus of the sentence of is how you feel and how it affects like me myself not how you like i'm speaking like when you're saying a sentence it's about how i feel and how it's affecting me and not that i'm trying to blame you i'm just trying to understand what's happening so 
Well, even just that question that I asked there, I started with a story of my own particular experience to in, in an attempt to relate to you in a way, try to find a way that we might have some common ground that way. And then I, at the end of it, I translated to you. I, I pointed it towards your direction there. But that might have also been a bad way to start it. What do you think on that? Should I have started it directly just for you? No, I think that was great because like you said, you were trying to find some sort of common ground and people want to hear and people want to connect, right? They want to hear stories. That's why I said um, more emotionally intelligent. That's like trying to like boosting and like saying like, oh my goodness, I'm so great. You know, that wasn't the point of it. Yeah. The point was it to say like, if there's someone out there listening and saying, okay, I also did really bad at school and like wasn't in most classes but there was something else that I'm good at then. Okay, so there's something else that I'm listening to. So it depends on your conversation. It depends on your goal of what you're trying to achieve, right? People usually say to use I for when they want to like blame someone, not blame is the wrong word, when they want to change something in mm -hmm. the other person. So then you, by saying the I, then you're not changing the other person. You're just explaining the situation. Like, I think you should change this versus, well, you know, perhaps that this thing could be better or something like that, more softer on the edge. Yeah, but you see, they said, I think you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You that was the bad. The you. Oh, I did use the you. They okay. see, so even though you said the I in the beginning, you uh -huh. like use the you. You want to say, like, when you do this, oh. it affects me like this. So I don't like it when you come home and leave the shoes in the what right so you're explaining the situation yeah. i don't like it when you come home and leave the shoes in the front it makes me feel like the house is messy so you're mm -hmm. putting even though this, you use the word you the sentence the mm -hmm. is about you like about the person speaking not about the person listening yeah so that's why like like you said like hearing that advice using i and you could get like more confusing it's more the mindset mm -hmm. of taking the responsibility instead of blaming it yeah, and I was trying to do a negative example there where basically like what we shouldn't do, but it's, it's interesting, just the power of you, I, we, and I was I remember watching a Charisma on Command video way while back of how there were different judges of this awesome singer. This girl was just made the whole audience happy. All the judges were all super excited for this X Factor, I think it was. And one of the guys just kept talking about himself, kept talking about himself, like, oh, I wish that I was able to have you on my team, something like that. And she's, she's just kind of standing there awkwardly and whatnot. And then Ricky Martin goes and like, you have the whole package and flip the coin, flip the script on her. That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great example. So yeah, that's great. I I love how just the first question itself was able to spawn so much other, many things. It seems like you're an <laughs> empath too. You're talking about the high emotional intelligence. The empath is what kept making me think about that. Oh yeah. Yeah. What are some lessons that you've learned from those people then that you've talked to? There is so much. <laughs> um, well, first thing, let's start with the bad thing. Okay. <laughs> I have assumed, I like, and not like we assume a lot of things. I really, really try hard not to assume and try to like test out even when I hear something new, right? So I'm not just going to go and try it and like assume that this is correct or incorrect. I'm going to go and try it and see if it's right. But there was one assumption I had that like I, I just had and then it just proved to me more and more that therapists who aren't good could just mess you up more. And mm. it is so true unfortunately having been in this space of like meeting speaking to like three or four of them a day then you see how much that's really not true mm -hmm. so I'm just like warning be out there like therapists could be great and they could really change your lives but do yeah. your research make sure they're good just yeah like my own like pre-question of that <laughs> and then there was another part you wanted to share yeah that, so that was like okay like the not so good thing but then like learning there's so much more things I think that we speak a lot about communication Mm -hmm. in relationships and it's really important I think that like not to put it down communication we need communication communicate about everything and like you said we even spoke about before communication right I you that's communication but mm -hmm. before communication comes something else that's self-awareness if you don't know what you're communicating or why you're communicating your communication your I and you sentences won't mean anything so really 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 a person has to become more self-aware develop that as skill to notice it automatically to maybe set time every day to realize what's going on or even before having a conversation set the intention okay what 
do I want being self-aware of myself in the situation, being self-aware of what my partner or whoever I'm speaking to wants in this conversation and what I want in the relationship between me and my partner. Mm. So once you have the awareness of that, then you could have a much greater communication. Yeah. Uh, just to give a good example, whenever I started the show, I realized that as a talker, I could be abrasive in a way. I could, I could talk over people by accident. And so I knew that I needed to work on self-awareness. That was a self-development goal for myself that I think I've done decently well. But even in this conversation here, I focused purely on t like listening to what you're having to say. And when you were saying something that sparked an idea, obviously, like most people want to try to talk like, like, like this is what I want. They start thinking about what they're going to talk about next instead of listening. And so having a self-awareness like, hey, no, cut that out. It'll come back later listen to what that person has to say. And I caught myself, stopped it and kept listening as well. And I think that's a really good example, just being able to practice that. And what are some ways do you think to help practice self-awareness and cultivate it? Yeah, so first for that, I do that all the time. If you listen to the podcast, you'll hear me like cut out people and then like, eh, never mind, I apologize. Cause like I'm noticed, like I'm still in the self-aware in this process versus actually being able to go into it so like we're on the same page on that mm -hmm. and second of all for that i found helpful to be is like while you're listening just to write down like one word so you're still listening to what they're saying but you don't feel like you're gonna forget what they said so like mm -hmm. okay so i like that she said self-awareness so you write down the words of make some breadcrumbs in a way yeah <laughs> yeah exactly and now how could a person become self-aware now that's a really difficult yeah. Something like I, my whole life, like had to try to go and figure out. And I was, used to always say like, okay, so you have, I believe you have all the answers inside you, mm -hmm. but there's just like so much noise going on. There's your family and friends and social media and news and everything else that like, you can't really know what you yourself want. I used to just say, okay, so like sit down and think what you want. Okay. Like really ask yourself, take the time and think. And eventually it will come to you. Say like, ask yourself, do I want this because I want this or do I want this because I saw the pictures, picture on Instagram or because my friend is doing this, like what mm -hmm. I want. And that could help, but it's really hard. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it is really, really hard. Especially starting from scratch, it seems too. Yeah. So when I came across this thing called creative journal, expressive arts, which is now what I do as coaching, I was like, okay, this is the tool. I don't know mm -hmm. if it works for everybody. I'm sure it doesn't work for everyone, I should say. But it is a great tool to help people become more self-aware because through the process of doing it, you don't think at all logically. You mm -hmm. write without thinking, and then you let your subconscious mind answer for you. Now, your subconscious mind is really self-aware. It knows what you want. It's not like caring about what the world is doing right so it literally goes straight there and just writes and then you get your answer so that is a great tool to get become more self-aware yeah well and before the show you had sent a link to your mentor um I was watching one of her videos and she was talking about how the creative journal is your journal and a lot of people when they take like bullet journal met method or just any other kind of journaling method it's open to people maybe reading them if they feel like it. But the, the creative journal is supposed to be really just self-expression, like you were saying there, and private is what she was saying on the video. Keeping it private to yourself, hide it away so people won't just pick it up randomly, and allow yourself to have that flow. And I think that because it's creative, it helps get you into the state of flow in the mental realm, and that might help alleviate some of the uh, inhibitions, so to speak. Oh yeah, literally it's that same mind, the same half of the brain is in charge of the creative part of the brain, right? The left side of the brain is in charge of all the logic stuff and the right side of the brain is in charge of all the creative stuff and the emotions with the subconscious. So just like you said, yeah, like it just comes, it just flows. And yeah, it is really interesting that you mentioned that it is your own journal. Literally no one could see it unless you decide very consciously okay i am choosing this piece of work not even my whole journal this mm -hmm. one thing with one specific person like some of my clients that i do this with i have no clue what's in their journals mm -hmm. and that's okay because it's their journals for them and they could go and figure it out so it's also really helpful for people who have a very hard time talking yeah. because no one has to know well in I Considering your wealth of experience with all these different people on your show, I figure like you're a good person to ask. I've always been a talker, but it's most of the time it's, it's, it's intermediate to low level conversations, not very deep. 
I don't always open up to very many people. I try to on these shows with a recordings like this, because this is what we're supposed to do. Like we're sitting here trying to open up and see what can come from that conversation. So what do you think are some things that either I could do or someone listening in to open up more and feel more open? I guess. You could. Yeah. It's a great question. Cause like I had a really hard time with it. I still like, I'm not perfect and have a long way to go, but have come really far. And there's a few things to know. First of all, everyone or majority of the world has a hard time with it so just like know that that's good to know Mm -hmm. second of all it's a process you're not gonna want to try to push yourself to go too far and then you're just gonna close everything back up Mm -hmm. you want to take it really slow and be really careful with who you're doing it to so Mm -hmm. you're gonna want to keep on testing okay so i'm gonna share this thing now what happens how's he responding I'm going to share this thing. Is it going well? And then you could go and say like, okay, this was fine. Like maybe it wasn't the reaction I expected, but it was okay. I'm okay with that. I could go further. (laughs) Also what you want to realize is that as you open up more, the other person will have an easier time opening up more, which will allow you to have an easier time. It goes back and forth, but mm-hmm. someone has to start that chain. So you say, okay, so I'll be first. And I know this other person will be, and if that person doesn't, then okay, you could stop there. So you just shared a tiny bit, right? We're not like going to the deepest. Yeah. Reaches. Right yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that also, like you said, someone has to start and that's kind of the basis of a foundation of a relationship. Just like we talked about earlier, finding that common ground to find somebody, you have to open up about yourself, get past that small talk, and open something like, hey, this is what I like. Maybe you like it. And that can start building that up. But it's interesting because if they don't have common ground with you, then you know that they probably aren't going to be a person that you should be friends with or date. And so that'd be a good person to cut off. Where do you see the act of separating yourself from people that won't be good for you? So that's a very broad question. Is it like, are you asking for a relationship? Are you asking for a business? like a friend it depends who where it is what what are you referring to i was thinking in a more general context in just the sense of whether it's business relationship or friendship if there's not enough common ground for you to actually make that relationship worth it i guess with in business case there might be a financial uh, motivation behind that but let's say in a friendship situation you meet someone at the coffee shop and you're like you want to become friends with this person but you find out they're not really not there's not that much of a click between the two of you should you just drop them off what if they're a best friend but they've gone apart that kind of thing i'm just I don't yeah know. so you want first like going back to self-aware is being self-aware of what you want in general as a friend obviously you don't want all your friends to be the same but do you want them to be more like positive vibes do you want more have fun and just let loose do you want to have deep conversations and you might want to have some friends in like different things because some of them you just go and you hang out with and like you're just letting loose and some of them this is more intellectual conversations but once you're aware of like your basic values of what they want then you're going to be open as long as you get along and as long as they're giving you what you you want and I don't like that actually that giving you what they want because you're there to give them in the relationship but you feel like they're supporting you and what you want Mm -hmm. they support your values and what you have then it might be great it's just a friendship you might decide that this is great and you want to speak to them three times a week or maybe every day and it might be less and maybe only once every other week but it's great to have these people in your lives because you never know what else you could give them or they could give you so yeah, like the cutoff point is, I think we're, as long as they align with your values. Yeah, having the self-awareness to know what your values and principles are and seeing if that person aligns with them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. So going back to your whole relationship photographer, what makes a strong shot for then a relationship-based photo? So I work a lot with emotions. That's okay. where it started with. That's what I love pictures. Like I always, I did pictures just like in general family portraits and models and stuff. And I found like the, my favorite part was the emotions. Uh So I went into that with a couple and what you do is you take the couple in their ultimate state of love and connection or whatever ever else feelings they want, right? They're going to become self-aware. I'm going to help them like realize and get to what they want. Cause yes, I'm very big on the (laughs) self-awareness. And then they're going to choose that picture that shows those emotions to hang up on the wall like a vision board. Mm, And that way it kind of reminds them over and over again too. Yeah, exactly. It reminds them over and over. It like 
goes into their mind even without them thinking about it and that way they could actually go and get there it's interesting i was just listening to atomic habits the other day and i've been working my way through that book and there's he talks about cues and i don't remember who discovered this particular uh aspect but for example one person wanted to be more productive and so he started listening to music with headphones on while being productive and writing and eventually he associated the the act of putting on headphones with the idea of being productive. And so he got into the state of productivity much quicker. The habit was much more formed because of that. And I think that that cue of that picture is quite similar into that headphones. Yeah, so that's a great book. I love that book, <laughs> first yeah. of all. Um, like really like builds up your life like as you do one thing and you work on it and you add more things, then you're yeah. like your more of your life gets better. And it's true that picture associates, like you said, like with the good relationship. But I think it's even more than that. You know, like the law of attraction, like, right? And how your brain works. So it's, your brain is going to see it all day, even if you don't see it. It's on the wall there. And like, just like you don't notice any of the other pictures after a few days they're hanging up. Yeah. You're not going to notice that one really until someone new comes into your ass and says, hey, that's a cute picture. I like that. But your brain sees it and your brain wants it and you're sending the messages to your brain. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not consciously looking at it and saying, hey, this is a pretty picture, your brain's going to try to find ways for you to be able to go and do it. Yeah, and contextualize it in the subconscious. And it's interesting, too, because one thing I wanted to talk to you about is the self edudevement concept I was talking to you about beforehand. And part of that is the self-development. In that self-development aspect, there's this philosophy I created called the four pillars of the life. And so you have the mind, body, spirit, and emotions. And a lot of people they might not want a more religious aspect behind spirituality. And I was thinking, you keep mentioning the conscious mind and law of attraction and even self-awareness. And I really think that self-awareness comes from the act of bridging the conscious mind with the subconscious mind through maybe meditation or deep walks. However, you can get into that alpha wave state. But I think that was a, a unique way to start a conversation with you. Yeah, and I, just like you said, walks or meditation well I do it with journaling <laughs> mm. and it's much easier like I found that much easier like I'm not a big fan of meditation I could see what helps but for some reason it hasn't clicked with me and I hadn't really been doing journaling like it was not my thing but when I was able to journal with my non-dominant hand that's the way we do it yeah with the non-dominant hand and because that your non-dominant hand is the opposite side of your hand which is opposite side of your body which is a child to your opposite side of your brain right and then you access your subconscious and you make that connection so all of a sudden this was something new something different and you could get into that state without doing something for me it was just much easier basically mm -hmm. well yeah. getting into the state of flow I, and i think that's what kind of what we're referring to here is that it's it's a matter of difficulty and skill level and so you're able to draw of course like it doesn't matter how what quality of drawing this is a matter of expression and so if you use your non-dominant hand the difficulty increases allowing for that arousal of focus to actually be increased and that's what i think gets you into that alpha wave state the hypofrontality as they say in the prefrontal cortex but it's interesting how that creative journal is able to get you into that i need to try that more yeah 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 and what you'll want to do is like to get the ultimate results is you'll want to use both sides of your brain mm -hmm. so the way you do it is you ask the questions with your dominant hand thinking logically and answer the questions without thinking subconscious answering for you and just write your answers with your non-dominant hand so you're like literally having a dialogue between your two hands which is really between the two sides of your brain and you get those answers could become more self-aware figure out those things that you want to figure out that's interesting. And so how has creative journaling shaped your life? It literally changed it. Okay. Like now when I have a challenge or I'm losing, like challenge could be something small. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like massive anything, but I got upset at someone. Things went, didn't go my way. The first thing my mind thinks of talking about atomic habits is yeah. the journal, like trained my mind that a challenge I'm frustrated I don't know what to do answers the journal mm -hmm. because I know that first of all I can release my emotions in there you could literally just take a marker or pen and move it to your non-dominant hand and scribble because 
that's attached to your emotions, that side of your, that hand is direct access to your emotions, all the emotions just come out. So instead of staying locked up or exploding, they come out on the paper. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards you could journal about it. And I know I'm going to get some sort of answer, some sort of clarity. If not now, then I'll journal about, about it again and I'll get again. So literally that's what I'll do. I'll think of something Diff like something difficult came up and now I'm not like, okay, I don't know what to do now. Someone mm -hmm. made me angry. I'm like fuming. Yeah. Maybe I still might want to vent or something, but first I want to do some journaling or even do something with like clay or paint. Cause we do all sorts of things. So from a personal level, mm -hmm. like, and I have a way to deal with life. Yeah. Well, and it allows you to understand your emotions more too. Why am I feeling this way? So to speak, I do have a question for you though. That, that, that takes time to do that journaling, even if it's only 15 minutes, 20 minutes, however long you're spending on it. What if you are away from your journal, such as yesterday I was going to work and I had a completely fat tire. Don't know how this happened, but the tire was completely flat. I would not have had time to go back at home and try and like express my emotions that way and understand why. I mean, obviously I know why I'm feeling that way. Cause it's like oh, crap. I got a flat tire, but how could I have more self-awareness in that situation to make sure I make the right decisions, that kind of thing? So there's a few things you probably want to do. First of all, like you don't have to be near your journal. Like if as long as they have a pen and some sort of paper to write on, you do that. But I don't think when you have a flat tire and you're standing <laughs> on the side of the road, that's what you're going to go into. So you might want to journal when you're calm, when you're home, when things are okay. What else can I do when I can't journal? Now for every person that might be different, that might be breathing deeply, that might be even just stamping your feet. Like who cares? You stand behind your car and that also lets out that emotion, right? No one has to see you like, stamping your feet out there um something like that you might want to do having some sort of output then essentially even if you have to hold it in for a little bit understanding why you have to hold it in and make sure you get it out in some shape or form or yeah keep... that's yeah yeah that's part of emotional regulation right you don't just like even though you have emotions you don't just like let them go everywhere so part of being the self-awareness is like okay so i'm keeping them in now i'm not keeping them in forever later on at night when i go in journal i could let that out yeah. So, yeah. In a much more productive manner too, not just say something like, yeah. Well, and one reason why I brought up the four pillars earlier is that you kept making me think of emotions and how a lot of people don't have the self-awareness of their emotions. It's really primitive for us to have emotions in a way. It comes from our more primitive brains. And because of that, we don't always even notice that we're feeling a certain way. We might get angry without even noticing that. You, you seem to notice well, I'm just like saying it for the audience's sake, but how can we start training that connection then not just with the journaling, but maybe in a more consistent basis on a daily basis on our own throughout our entire days. How can we be more aware of our emotions? Yeah. So first thing, I think that a lot of people think emotions are bad. Hmm. Now emotions aren't bad and they mm -hmm. aren't good. They just are. They yeah. are there to tell us messages that something's wrong, right? You're getting angry because for a reason, there's a message that you have to go and do. You're frustrated about something for a reason, happy for a reason. So First, understand that because when you think that they're bad, you're going to run or run away from them and you're not going to want to try to yeah. find them because they're bad, right? Like even when you're little, like what did your mom tell you? Stop crying. Mm -hmm. Not because just because like stop crying. She couldn't like handle it. She felt bad for you. So she just thought stop crying. But really, no, you should let your kid cry. They'll figure it out. Kids could deal with their emotions yeah. until we go and interfere with them. <laughs> so that's first of all. Second of all, now, so anyone listening to this conversation, maybe they never thought of it before, right? Like their emotions, we get so on busy with our lives and we just don't think about it. The first step to being self-aware is being aware of the concept. So now everyone who's listening now knows that they have emotions and we many times don't realize them and now could put it in the front of their brain to try to think about it. And you might want to do that. You might say, okay, I want, let me see if I could notice my emotions three times today or however uh, you want to do it, what works for you, and then either write it down or just make a mental note of it, like remember where you were standing. Or, and just be aware, before you even do anything about it, be aware of this emotion. Right now, I am feeling excited. And you might even want to notice, okay, so what am I doing now? Am I like have extra spring in my step? Am I smiling? What am I doing that is making me excited? that is showing that I'm excited, that I'm aware I'm excited. And once you have that awareness, then you could go and work on it and decide how you want to go and deal with it. 
I love it. And I think too, that's a really good way of exemplifying the four pillars as well. Cause I think a lot of people don't realize how much the emotions affects your mentality, your physical st- uh, body, and as well as even your spirituality in a way, uh, a lot actually, but it's interesting because the temperature of the body changes depending on emotion. If you're scared or cold, you're going to start being cooler in the body, not cold, scared, sad. If you're sad, your body's going to cool down. If you're happy or excited, you're going to start heating up. And it's just interesting how you can start changing the physical aspects of your body purely based on emotion. And if you don't realize that you're feeling emotion, you may not even realize you're changing your body, but that also could be a sign too to help you. Right. It goes both ways. They work hand in hand. Yeah, exactly. So going on to your show then, what was the reason that you started a Life Picks Relationship podcast with ST? Okay, so I was doing this relationship photography, and Mm -hmm. then I love the law of attraction of setting the mind, but I also believe that you have to do stuff about it, and I can't just like sit there hanging on the wall and expecting nothing to happen. So I wanted to help the people I was dealing with like how else could they make their relationships amazing and then I did a few things so one of them was this CJA right now I mix this creative journaling expressive arts with the photography like we journal before the photo shoots about the pictures and we really understand why they want this relationship what is stopping them from wanting this relationship anyone who's listening could do the same find a picture when you had an amazing relationship and journal about it. Ask those questions, right, with your dominant hand and answer with your not dominant hand. And then I was like, okay, what else is there? And I came to, I was like, I could find out. I'm really curious to know. And I'm sure there are people out there also to know. I was like, okay, so I'm going to do a podcast. I like podcasts from a podcasters, like listening mm-hmm. point of view. And it was great. I really get to meet all kinds of people literally type of people who I've never been able to meet if not for being able to run podcasts and yeah Yeah. (laughs) so true and learning tons of things opening my eyes to things getting a deeper understanding of things podcast thing I love because it goes very deep into conversations you could really understand not just like hey okay so here's a tip and I think you should start your sentences with I you could go and have a whole conversation about it and really understand it so yeah, it was really just to learn myself and learn for everyone else out there how they could go and make the relationship extraordinary. Yeah, that's great. It's fantastic. And I think too, you have a nice uh, blue ocean, as they say in the business terms, having that good niche because you have that creative journaling and the romance, the romance or relationship, not romance, relationship photography. And the way they combine together is really interesting. Did you, when you started out with the recording, were you recording your clients for photography or recording just with guests that you had on? So no, I recorded random guests. Usually my clients tend to be much more private. I don't know, for some reason, I just get attracted to those people. I don't know why, you know, like, don't like being posted on Instagram and things like that. Um, That's why I was confused. I was like, okay, I wanted to clear. (laughs) Yeah, no, so I was like, anyone who has an amazing relationship or an extraordinary relationship in any which way, then I want to hear about them. So either from a personal point of view, from a professional point of view, what tips could you give so that other people could also have it because I think everybody deserves it as long as they put in the work they should and I think that once you have an extraordinary relationship it really affects all other areas of your life they support you and they want you to be successful in business in your health and whatever else you're interested in hopefully it's a great relationship they're there to support you also yeah mutual support so to speak and so you have this positivity or around you just you seem so bubbly and happy and I love it what one thing I keep kind of thinking about is stoicism and how they use negative visualization to see what bad things could happen where do you see the benefits of doing something like that versus focusing on the positive okay so in general my philosophy I guess I should say of life in this aspect in general mm-hmm. is there's no point really in focusing on the bad what you're going to want to do is focus on where you are being really clear about that so if that is bad that's okay because you're not focusing it from the aspect of bad you're focusing on right now i am here this is how my relationship looks this is how my fitness is this is how whatever else is and then you're going to want to focus on where you want to go but if you want to get to a million dollars or 
have this dream house, if you don't know where you're standing, you're never going to get there. I was just going to say, like, um, when it comes to negative visualization, it's not necessarily bad. It's more of saying, like, what's the worst that could happen? And just accepting the fact that if that did happen, it wouldn't really be that big of a deal. And I think a lot of people drum up a lot of emotions around this idea of something bad happening. But if that bad thing were to happen, like, if I if I were to have that flat tire and it completely hit me tomorrow and I didn't, I, I imagined it today, it wouldn't be that big of a deal because I was able to fix it yesterday. I was able to get it done. It wasn't as big of a deal as I thought it was going to be, especially in the moment. So that negative visualization is more about seeing how that could be brought to you being more positive over a negative situation. I don't, I don't think I explained that well, but. Yeah, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So I guess you could like totally disregard my other answer, like totally not. No, it's good. It's a good do. answer. Don't, don't disregard it. <laughs> Um, but I think it's more, again, I don't like focusing on the negative, Mm -hmm. right? But the mindset of making, always like, how could I make this work? So if you have that mindset, then when you get that flat tire, you're not overwhelmed. Like, okay, so I had this, like, let me go and figure it out. I don't think, especially you have to go beforehand and try to visualize it in case it happens. Unless you're going into a really difficult situation, like mm-hmm. you're going to hospital to meet someone like right before they die or something like that, and like you want to prepare yourself mentally for it on like a very strong case, day-to-day things like a flat tire to me isn't something to like dwell upon and like really think about. Maybe it's helpful for other people. I don't mm-hmm. want to just like say no to ev- to it just like that. But when you change your mindset, like I said, like then you'll figure it out. Like, I'm not worried. Like, okay, I had flat tires in the past. It'll be okay. Like, I dealt with other things even if I didn't have a flat tire. I know I'll be fine. Yeah. So, so you mentioned your philosophy. Mine, mine is more balanced. I, I always try to find what, what is the balance between these two dichotomies in a way. And so with your positivity, I was just thinking, what would be the opposite and what would be the benefits of doing that and seeing what we could find in the middle. And I think the way you explained it was really good too. I think the way that focusing more on the day-to-day stuff, because those big things aren't going to happen very often. And if you need to do some negative visualization because it's such a serious, dire situation, sure, okay. But there's still more to it. You're talking more about being proactive and having a much more positive outlook. And I think that's probably much stronger, especially in the long run. Yeah, it works for me. And yeah. I, don't know, I guess for you, it works different or for others. No. There is like, I don't, I'm very into it. Like there's not uh-huh. one way is all <laughs> like, that's the answer to it. So that's for my answer and how I run my life. I love it. I, th- I think that it, uh, I wasn't disregarding it at all. I think that's actually really good. I just like to see the both sides of the coin, so to speak. You know what I mean? I like that. So you actually been going after this podcast for at least about six months now. And it's usually where people drop off. They actually quit around here. So how have you kept it going? Okay, so first of all, I absolutely love it, okay? okay? Yeah. So there's, like, nothing I get to meet. New people, learn new things, so my speed. This is just, like, so for me. Second of all, even though I love it, I knew that in order for it to keep on happening and being able to put out two episodes every week, wow. I need to do work in a way that is going to work for me, work for my lifestyle, for the way I run doing everything else that I do, that I put this, try to create a plan that works for me. So what I do is I record for about like three or four weeks, a whole bunch of episodes, and then I don't need to record for the next three months. Mm. So although I'm there, scheduled I could forget about it afterwards I do like social media and stuff but technically that is still running and till the end of September I could forget about it Mm -hmm. a little a few weeks before that I'm gonna go do again yeah yeah well it's it's content batching as they say and I I think it's it's something I actually need to get better at doing but I have been sort of doing it with this show it's kind of weird so I, I, I think you're my 39th guest and I started at the end of May wow yeah that's a lot yeah. Uh, but it's one of those things, like you said, it's super enjoyable. And that made me think about asking you, do you consider yourself more of an extrovert or introvert or ambivert? <laughs> when I was a kid, I considered myself an introvert. And now I don't know. <laughs> well, I think as we age, it does change. I think a lot of people think of this idea of like, it's only one throughout your entire life, but not only do our values change as we age, but our ideas of what is fun and how we spend our time with people or not, or by ourselves, I think it's changing too. So I think that's probably a good thing for it to not know. Might be uh, enough. 
I, yeah, maybe I should like become more self-aware about that. <laughs> do some meditation <laughs> on it and practice that too. Something. Yeah. 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 I know I do like really enjoy spending time with myself and just doing things by myself, but I also love meeting new people. So. Yeah. Well, and speaking of meditation too, just real quick, I think it's interesting because I, I've realized that my attention span doesn't go past 13 minutes when it comes to meditation. Don't know why. It's always 13 minutes. I'll get like to sit in there for a long time, just fine. As soon as that 13 minute mark hits, I'm like, sorry to like, okay, what am I doing? It's just weird. What was your experience with meditation? She said you didn't quite like it as much. I'm curious about that. Yeah. So my attention span is even less than that. In general, <laughs> I know I have to plan my work, not to do something like computer work for so long. It won't work. I won't be able to. I usually sit on a ball because I know I could like bounce about, you know, like that sort of thing. So first of all, that was that. Second of all, my mind would just race and run. And like, because I'm constantly thinking throughout the day, like in consciousness mm -hmm. and I asked tons of questions, it was much harder for me to like put that aside and get into my subconscious and my flow state sort of thing. So I would try it from time to time. I never really connected with it. It wasn't like I did it once and said that was it. Um, and I, like you said, also for me, the better ones were ones that were short, even like three or four minutes. Like mm -hmm. it was like I would get something maybe more out of. But once I found the journaling and I found a way to connect that way, I was like, I might as well use something that works for me. And I focused yeah. much more on that. Well, and I don't think as them being mutually exclusive, I think they're actually more beneficial to each other, the journaling and the meditation. I resonate with you with the whole, like having shorter bouts is a lot more useful, especially it's more like a muscle. It feels like it's like training the brain to sit there and focus. And it's not about clearing the mind per se. It's just a matter of seeing that thought, allowing it to exist and then letting it go, not dwelling on it and thinking about new thoughts from that. I think that's where a lot of people get stuck. They're like, I don't want to be empty, especially if you have a more hyperactive mind or someone who has just, just like a ton of information coming in all the time. It's kind of hard to be like, hey, there's a lot of ideas going around in here. I can't be blank, but you can be one at a time. And I think that's really key. Yeah, yeah. So I have to try that again. Where do you want to take your podcast going back to that? <laughs> so I would love for it to grow even bigger mm. um, and more people to know and I just, my goal is really to get all sorts of perspectives from like literally all different people, all different walks of life, different ages, different mm -hmm. life experience. And that's my goal, I guess, to bring out more of that information in one place for people to go and find out what works for them. Because like I said, I don't think there's only one thing that works. So that's why even when I have guests who I completely disagree with them and I think that they're wrong. It worked for them. It made their relation, relationship great. Who am I to say, you know? Yeah. So I, yeah. Well, and whether or not you agree with them or not, it doesn't, you don't know how your future might end up. Something that might change in your particular path that will be like, oh, you know what? That guest said something really interesting a while back. I might be able to use that now. So if you can't, may not be able to use it now, but down the line, you might be able to. Yeah. And it was also that I remember there's like one specific episode I really, really didn't like, I'm mm -hmm. not going to say details in case someone afterwards goes listen to then like whatever, but I really, like I came out of there as like almost like, okay, do I have to post this? But like, I'm like, okay, I'm reminding myself that there's like, it was like the whole thing in general. Like I remember like there's almost nothing of the whole thing I didn't like. Mm -hmm. And afterwards I got quite a few comments. She had one specific, really interesting story. And a lot of people told me that that like, opened up their minds to more things and made them realize more things that I was like, just for that, it was worth it. Mm -hmm. Even if the whole rest of the episode, there was nothing in it, but people got out of there, it's worth it. So like you said, even if either it's now, maybe it's in the future and maybe it's not the whole thing, but there's one yeah. part that like, maybe. yeah, focusing on the positive too, like we were kind of talking about earlier. And on top of that too, I think as hosts, even if we don't always agree with everything, it's our kind of job to our audience to even still post it, I guess you could say. I guess that would depend on your type of show because mm. if your show is like about you and your life or oh, the yeah, yeah. You're like giving tips and things, then it would be different versus like someone like you who are me who are like more getting information from other people. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the same type of host as you that has to, <laughs> it's our job for the audience. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I actually have, this is just one of my series on the show. So I have 
two other, three other different series that I do solo that I have on here too. So I do both. Do you ever think about doing solo casts? So no, because I'm not the expert. (laughs) Well, I I wouldn't discredit yourself because you've already provided a lot of advice and knowledge. And even if it's regurgitation or just from your own experience, I probably, I presume too, it's interesting just how much you were able to provide. And so just don't discredit yourself is what I want to say. Yeah. So that's why I'll still go on here and like tell you, and I like, love being guests it's another way to meet people because like mm-hmm. there's a limit to how many people like can meet for my f- show um so I still do that but I don't think yet hopefully sometime in the future mm-hmm. for sure like when I'm in a relationship I'll have like everything come out you know <laughs> um you can but, make it an event <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and like bring all my old guests on and tell them okay so like because of you I now have this knowledge and now like we're gonna go and do something but yeah like you said I I, I have to just I'm like being careful you know watching what i'm saying not yeah yeah but, uh, <laughs> considering your like cr- cr- interdisciplinary creative skills i think that is a good question for it it's, it's something i ask all my guests too is what is a polymath to you i think a polymath is someone who does a lot of things and knows a lot of things then i think maybe even ends up without even realizing mixing everything in together a little bit just my own opinion not like purposely but when you have things in your toolbox you're gonna end up pulling out things differently at least i know i do that yeah it's completely valid in fact that's one reason why it's a benefit to be someone who's polymathic or generalistic because you have that ability to interweave between different skill areas and it's it's something that we've talked about a lot on this show actually because you're able to like you said subconsciously i think is a really key aspect there that other people haven't really alluded to is that people do it without realizing it if you're polymathic by nature you're not always going to think about hey i know this piece of knowledge because of a different skill that's completely unrelated to this but it applies to this and i think that's really interesting yeah 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 well i for sure do that perfect <laughs> so moving into the next question then here what are some secrets to relationships that people often don't think about it's a deep question i know <laughs> secrets to relationships that people often don't think about hmm Okay, well, I'm going to go back to self-awareness. Okay. <laughs> I'm so big on that. Um, yeah, I think people aren't, like, have to be self-aware. Like, before you get into a relationship, what you want in your relationship, make your list get really clear. And then throughout your relationship, just being self-aware of that. But we already hmm. spoke a lot about that, so I'm not going to speak more about that. Well, if you feel like that's the best way to answer it, if self-awareness is the theme of the episode, that's fine. I'll put it in the title. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just am like so pro it that yeah. it's like, okay. Um, but there's other secrets I think that could be spoken about. Um, I think there's one thing I really like. Someone once said really well, who, I guess when we speak to another person, right, I'm speaking to you or you're, let's say you're speaking to me while you're talking to me. I'm automatically playing a movie in my brain of what you're saying, okay? Mm. So you're telling me the story of retire, and I'm, like, imagining it from my outside perspective of what's happening. I'm seeing visions. I'm saying what I think happened, right? Now, based on what I see is how I'm going to respond. When you speak to anyone else, especially your partner, you're going to want to try for those moments while they're talking to put your video on pause and go mm-hmm. into their movie and yeah. see it from their perspective. So instead of saying like, okay, you should have done this and this and this instead say, okay, so, oh my gosh, that was really tough for you that you had that. Even if you disagree mm-hmm. with what they were saying and you think you should have been differently while you're listening, listen to their movie. And listen to the way they explain it. Cause the way that the person explaining it, especially if they use more and more details, could allow for a much different visualization than what you might just initially create on your own. Yeah, exactly. You're not trying to think of what you're going to answer while they're speaking. It's a bit like active listening. It is active listening, but it's taking it one step further. It's really, really going into their shoes and seeing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's a great tip. I think that's kind of a good way of going about that saying too. Uh, see yourself in that person's shoes. It reminds me of something we talked about earlier with emotional intelligence. You said you weren't really like that book smart, so to speak, but there's actually 
I don't remember the name of the guy who made it, but there's nine different intelligences. And he's even thought about doing a 10th one or something like that. But he's, he was trying to explain the different aspects of human intelligence. There's naturalistic, knowing how plants are, what plants, like, I know what plant that is just based on what by seeing it kind of thing because you know how plants evolve that kind of way or there's logical and spatial and then there's the more uh mathematical one because it's separate than the logic so to speak not critical thinking and you have the emotional and, and there's various different types of intelligences and it reminds me of the spatial intelligence being able to visualize in your brain how something looks like so if i'm driving around i can have google maps street view in my head of my city that i'm in because i'm just so used to it and i'm able to visualize literally how the city looks and i think that's when you were telling me the story about being in someone's shoes i was literally imagining how i would look in that person's shoes looking down at that person i thought that was just an interesting segue or not segue of tension yeah yeah hmm. it is really interesting we all like you said have different i really think that has to do with what I do Feuerstein a bit slightly doesn't they don't define it as nine different intelligence but more is the way we think and the cognitive functions but for sure we and I think that's part you know it's part of self-awareness and it's part of relationships to answer your question is you're gonna view the you're gonna view life one way your partner is gonna view life another way you're gonna want to find something not compromising I don't like that word mm. you're gonna want to find something that works for both of you that both of you are a hundred percent happy when you have that self-awareness that communication to be able to understand really where they are coming from don't make assumptions ask questions and like a lot of questions not just like oh yeah no really really make sure you fully understand what they're saying mm -hmm. then you could get to the root and you could work find something that works out for both of you yeah well and i think kind of what you're alluding to earlier too is that everyone is different and different people people have different intelligences and understanding that person's way of thinking through that intelligence could be a way to understand them in their own shoes more too and finding that balance going back to our philosophies that that balance between not a compromise but the balance between making sure both people are supportive yeah yeah exactly love it win-win is you say yeah win-win <clears throat> game theory uh what are some steps to becoming more vulnerable to others so this is a kind of different topic here but how can we be more vulnerable i think it's a bit similar to like we said before opening up mm -hmm. um of like being self-aware <laughs> starting with that um and then Again, you're going to want to find people that you could be vulnerable to. So if we're talking about your relationship, obviously it's your partner. You're the person you're the most vulnerable with and you share with them everything. Some people will disagree with me. I think that pretty much everything should go there under that. Um, but obviously over time, it's mm -hmm. not going to take, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a process. And because vulnerability is so hard, you're going to want to push yourself just a tiny bit that it's a little bit painful and hard, but you know the results that are going to come afterwards. And if you're in a really supportive, and if you're in a good relationship, hopefully that's supportive and good, then you'll see that your partner wants you to be supportive. You might tell your partner before, okay, I want to tell you something that's really hard for me to say. So they'll be more aware of what, like, if you could not judge me about this, I would appreciate it. You might want to do that. That's again, going back to self-aware, you're knowing that it's going to be hard for you to say this. And you know that you're, it might be hard for your partner to hear it. So you are then going to communicate about that self-awareness that you just had, and then create the space that you could do it it should be something in your relationship that it's okay to say anything and everything we might disagree mm -hmm. but it's not going to become a huge fire argument or something we have different opinions and that's okay because if you have the same th opinion as your partner then you're not your own person but you are creating a space to be safe to be okay to share anything and you're going to want to reciprocate that to your partner so they feel safe and like we said before, one person starts and it goes deeper. Yeah, starts compounding. This kind of leads to my next question here. It's a bit different, but it's interesting nonetheless. What do you think of radical honesty then in communic or communication, like being more open than what pe most people would be? In a relationship? 
I was thinking, considering that's what we were talking about, relationships are good contacts, but I think just in general, too, is a really interesting concept. Just being r- pretty radically honest in general with most people, I think it would be a very interesting society. Yes. Uh, I'm really pro-honesty, I should say, like for a lack of better words, but I really think, yeah, like radical honesty is, by the end of the day, it wins. Mm-hmm. Well, sometimes it can be abrasive to some people. Yeah, so being really honest doesn't have to is you still have to be aware of how you're saying it right Mm -hmm. you're not just going to want to go and tell someone i'm really honest i think you're mean i'm going to tell you you're mean Mm -hmm. no if this is a person obviously that you have influence on and you think would be better if they would change and there's a reason for why and all like going on and on and on then you would find a way to be able to say i think you should change this that doesn't take away from the honesty. You're still being mm-hmm. honest. Just how are you saying that? You, choosing your words carefully, so to speak, being wise yeah. about it. And that, that also kind of leads me to an idea of like, where do you see body language and micro expressions coming into understanding others? So that's a really big one for me yeah. because <laughs> like I said, emotional intelligence, that's like uh-huh. almost like my superpower. <laughs> reading people and understanding them just like from them standing there um and watching how they interact with others um so i think it plays a massive role so if we want to play that in context with telling your honesty you have to be self-aware why you're being honest (laughs) i just had to say that i was gonna say be aware but i had to just say it like that yeah (laughs) <laughs> why you're being honest meaning yeah. like we said going back to that example you think someone's mean so you're gonna what's your goal of being honest why do you want to tell them that they're mean just to like get mad at them well grow up you don't have to like express your emotion sorry. That way. Yeah, yeah that way you're be self-aware with yourself about that you know but if there's a reason for it then you're gonna want it to be a reason that you're coming from a place of understanding them of caring about them of loving them so automatically first of all your words will be different Mm -hmm. second of all your body language your tone of voice will be different also because you're not coming to attack them you're coming to try to help them to understand them to support them and you're not here to change anyone including your partner you're not here to change them but if you think it will be beneficial you care about them so much you want them to change about this and you want honesty about that then you are going to come from that understanding point of view and Mm. even if it's like not someone you especially care about like let's say a business partner right but you care about this deal about what's happening about the money that's involved or your relationship that's involved you're still going to want to come from that point of understanding why are they doing this what's going on here let's see what we could do to make this work so even if you're being honest your body language follows yeah. Well, and I think a radical honesty really kind of fits into that pretty well too. A couple of little things here. The other day, me and my roommate were looking at like, where do we want to eat today? And it was interesting because I said something, he's like, okay, that sounds good. And then I said something else and you could just see the mm, little bit of, little bit of micro expressions there. And I'm like, okay, you don't like that one. Let's go to the other one. <laughs> yeah. And then the second thing was there's a show called Lie to Me. Have you watched it? No. You should. Cause it's all about micro expressions and stuff like that. Uh, lie, to, lie to me of course yeah. actually i sorry didn't i think you said light and lightning something sorry oh, no, it, it, i do not watch <laughs> i hate watching mm. and that is like one of the only movies that TV well, series, TV whatever, show, yeah. that i watched <laughs> the literally like binge watched the whole thing because i was like obsessed with it yeah <laughs> so i guess i pulled out a book here because i think you'll like it because essentially it's all about emotional awareness here but Paul Lightman is the main character of that show. He is based off of a real person named Paul Ekman, who is like the founder of microexpressions, like that kind of ideal like science. And he did an inter- like an interview with the Dalai Lama. So he takes the science of the microexpressions combined with the Buddhist philosophy, and they have a discourse on how things are similar, and just it's just fascinating. So cool! You need to tell me the name of that book, and you check yeah, it out. Be happy to. <laughs> and so. <laughs> One second, I needed to just comment you that you were saying before okay, yeah. about your roommate that you went and you were listening. Yeah? yeah, that that shows that you were really listening, right? Because you weren't just like, okay, whatever, same thing. Without him even saying anything, you picked up on his body language and you realized what was going on 
and you were actually listening to him. That is something that we need to be doing more in our society. Yeah, definitely. So, if, yeah, uh, one more little, no, no, one more little tangent, because I think it's kind of exciting, because I teach water aerobics and swim lessons, and so a lot of psychology and microexpressions come into that, understanding how people react. So, for example, when people run out of air, they start panicking, and you can start noticing a lot of body language, like, hey, they're speeding up, they're smacking, they're splashing, they're not doing well because they're out of breath. This one example, but when I'm teaching a water aerobics class, and there's like 20 people, 30 people in front of me, Reading a whole class is a really unique skill in that regard because it's, it's, it's fascinating how you can read the body language because they're in the pool too. So half their body is like obscured, but like, just understanding how they're reacting. And one thing I find really hard to get around, maybe you can help me, is that when people are focused, it looks like they're grumpy. And so I, I read them wrong. But like, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just really interesting reading crowds. I guess public speaking is another way of going about it too. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the more people you... Like, it depends. I think it's very relatable to, like, when you're doing, let's say, a session one-on-one with a person, like a therapy session or something, you're going with one person really deep. Mm -hmm. When you are giving a speech to a thousand people, you're getting information to much more people, but you can't go as deep. So it goes together with, like, their body language when you're working with one person you could actually connect with them you're giving water giving swimming lessons to one kid or i don't know exactly how it works but much less people (laughs) then you could be much more aware of exactly what's going on versus when you're there's much more people involved than you have even if you notice all of it first of all you're not going to notice all of it because there's much more people second of all even if you notice it you have to decide what's important here this one specific person or this group so yeah it's balance yeah i wanted to get your perspective on that because that'd be interesting so what is the secret to asking more powerful questions in life that's a big question i know but that is i fun. love that question because i love asking questions yeah is it like a numbers game so to speak like how how can we do more powerful questions how can we really make those stronger connections with people through those questions and being more connected yeah so first of all right like you said it's part of it could be numbers but it's not really numbers it's really listening to what they're saying and asking questions on what they're saying so the numbers isn't like okay so i want to ask 500 questions and cover a lot of ground when you want to ask more powerful questions your goal is to get deeper to the core of what they're saying so it may not be especially the wording that you use but it could Mm -hmm. i'm not like saying that completely but the biggest biggest factor is listening to what they're saying and to what they're not saying in all their body language and going and asking those questions and in my opinion always push like a tiny bit further than you think you could because like sometimes you think like okay could I ask this question or not Mm -hmm. if you're not sure you could ask them okay so I have this personal question do you think do you mind asking and then either they'll say yeah they'll say no but at least you're preparing them for it. You're going to want to, again, create that space to be able to ask those questions. But yeah, it's really listening to what they're saying and asking based on that. Yeah, having the self-awareness of it. And then on top of that too, just being able to understand what, how they're going about your question and seeing how they react to it. And one thing that kind of makes me think of is I've always been an avid video gamer throughout my life. And some of those games will have dialogue options. And so depending on your level of the character and just certain skills, you'll have the ability to ask those more powerful questions to these people. And it's just interesting how they formulate it. Either you have the, like, the more good choice, the worst choice, or the mediocre choice, so to speak. And I think that you can visualize conversations in real life that way too, if you're used to that kind of system. And I think it's a fun way to kind of say like, hey, is this question I'm about to ask one of those more not so good choices, a good choice or a mediocre choice and kind of finding that in your own head. Yeah. That's an interesting way of putting it. I never thought of it like that. I like much more, but it's interesting. I like that. Mm-hmm. I usually think of like the other person. Okay. So I'm right now in this situation right now. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to understand this person because that's your goal of asking the questions. Usually you want to understand more about the person, right? It's not about you usually when you're asking questions and <laughs> you're so it's like what can i do to connect to this person to get deeper to really understand them but i like that um good bad and mediocre sort of 
mindset. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that too, as like podcast hosts too, for example, we have to have that ability to ask those more powerful questions. And I think that too, the questions here today, I'm not, not to toot my own horn, but like some of them were more powerful questions. So we we're able to spawn more interesting tangents. And I think that you and I both got along really well from the beginning, which is great. It's because it's like one of those things too, like you never know what to expect. I don't do those pre-show like calls to like vet uh, guests. I, I might down the line, but I think it's more interesting just to see how we react right away. And there's oh, much yeah. more <laughs> nuance behind that. And like, yeah. So I think it's just interesting how we can just get dive deep into it. Well, kind of going back to that self eat development concept I brought up earlier. What has, what is self-development to you and your own personal journey? Okay, so self-development has pretty much been there my whole life. Uh, I got lucky with my mom being a life coach and bringing it in. Have She constantly wanted to go get trainings, you know, having us watch things, different books in the house and those things. So, But even with it in the house, not everyone was in it as much as me. I like these things and I like to learn new things. And I love it. I hated school so maybe like that's where I got to get my learning from because like I yeah I left school at 16 okay so yeah. I mean hey I my best learning experience in school was when I went to the library and burned through the entire philosophy section in a matter of months that was the only wow. like, experience that I remember enjoying. my favorite section <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly well and I think too like um this kind of comes back to that selfie to death but I, I made that term because I think it's more than just development it's the education that you chose to apply that's the foundation your own cho chosen learning then you have the self-improvement the atomic habits the deep work and what can you do every day to get into that flow state that, that creative journaling what can you do to keep that progress and action going forward and then finally you have the self-development which becomes the more exponential factor those books that we're reading the one that we mentioned earlier here too this one book could make a big difference in your life for all we know this one interaction that you had with me could lead you to that book to lead to a different whole new path for you we don't know and so i think that that exponential factor behind that is really fascinating you even yeah. see me getting all like up the up about it yeah, well, I'm loving this. So, <laughs> it's like catnip. <laughs> so, what's your secret or method then for staying consistent on growth habits? So, okay, so I'm going to go back to what okay. you asked me, similar to what you asked me, how I've been consistent with my podcast. It's, first of all, something that I absolutely love. I truly believe that whatever you do, you should love, right? I don't care if it's your job, it's what whatever you're doing you're not there might be parts that you don't like like i hate editing pictures i absolutely editing the worst <laughs> but i love taking pictures of people i love connecting with them so i love my job as a relationship photographer right so with everything yeah i hate social media same thing it's part of my job i have to do it um so yeah so first of all love it like you're if you if it's important to you Mm -hmm. If it's something that anyone who's like listening, who like wants to know how they could continue doing it, you're going to want to create that love. You could do that also. You could train your mind to associate that with good things, with great things. This brings me joy. Just like you could train your brain to love exercise and some people hate it and the pain and the everything that comes afterwards. I love it. It's such fun. So awesome. Makes me feel great. I love it. So that same sort of thing. So I guess yeah. first of all, that's... That. And second of all is also, like I said, finding a way that would make it work, makes it work for my life. Mm -hmm. So for everyone that's different. Just, just to kind of call you out just a little bit there, you said that you have to do the editing, you have to do those more boring tasks, but going back to the whole Atomic Habits books, changing the word that you use in your own mind there, you get to do the editing. Man, yeah. I get to do this show and I get to do the editing on top of it. Wow, that's awesome. It's yep. Much more mm -hmm. positive outcome there. <laughs> could be even different because I could go and send it off for someone else to go and deal with my editing. So I know somebody if you want to, by the way. Okay. Okay. Have to. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> so I felt you'd be a great person to ask this, but, and I kind of already did earlier, but how can we achieve more mindfulness in life? Okay. I'm going to go with what helped me. Okay. And that is the CJEA situation. Whatever you're going to want to be mindful, mindfulness is like a, a mindset. It's like a way of running your life, right? You don't want to, obviously, want to be mindful like in certain situations, but you want to be mindful and self aware. I think they're very interrelated. Um, 
in general on life. So by starting with smaller things, it's going to build up to something that happens automatically without you even thinking about. So going back, journaling is a great way. I don't care if you decide to do it every morning or like set a specific time of day to do it, or you decide you make it a habit to do it when something specific happens, similar to atomic habits, mindset of attaching it to something else, right? So I attach it to when there's like some sort of challenge or something difficult happening, but you could say maybe when every time something at work happens or every time something at home happens or whatever it is. So that way you get into it and then you just journal about that situation questions with your dominant hand answer with your non-dominant hand and see what happens you'll yeah. get your answers it's really cool i like that review there at the end so in case people were forgetting how to go about it too that's perfect and just a few more questions before we end up wrapping up here what started genius relationships okay so as i mentioned earlier i was looking for more ways to go and help the couples i was dealing with and help couples in general right because mm-hmm. i can't go and help everyone um and I don't think I'm capable of it. So I decided similar to the mindset of the podcast of getting all different things together, of getting all different relationship experts, like marriage therapists and top people in this field, create videos and tips of their top ways of getting amazing relationships and putting it together all in one course, all in one platform for you to be able to go and make your relationship extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So you get things from all different things. You pick out the things that work best for you. And there you go. You get your genius relationship. There you go. Well, and how has that grown for you? It's been interesting. First of all, I got to meet many new people and it's something that's growing like slow and steady. I should say I didn't like, okay, bam it out whenever and like all of a sudden flowed everyone came to it because like that's what happens i mean like when you have like i don't know uh audience like tony robbins and like comes out with a new thing then like he's gonna have everyone running to it but you have to start somewhere yeah exactly like you said slow and steady it's been doing great people are loving it and because it's not like in a way i like it better because as uh, it's constantly growing, like adding more videos, getting more experts, getting more things to it, then as I have more people getting into it and they share their tips of like, hey, I wish we had this instead and that instead, I could do that better. So if I were mm. to have, I don't know, 100,000 people listen to it all at the same time, then that would be like a bit harder for me to afterwards go and adjust and add. Yeah. Well, and then can you tell me more about the course? So it's really interesting. The way it works is you, every week you get emailed a new password to the next video, to the next expert. And we start off with, I like just priming you getting ready into the state. And then you get the video tips, like 20, 30 minutes of the expert sharing their video. And then I'll come back on and share just life tips and life hacks, more things that you could do to make your overall life in general, because they work hand in hand, your relationship's getting better, your life's getting better, your life's yeah. getting better, your relationship will get better. And then we get, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, you get all those like email reminders and like um, worksheets to follow along and all the support you need to go and like see what happens, see what's working out. And it's amazing. So then finally in here, what, what is a genius relationship? So I think it's Albert Einstein. I hope I'm getting that correct. I should like, rem, like really check that up again. <laughs> but who says that genius relationship is, take, is genius, is taking something complex and putting it into, making it simple, like for mm-hmm. anyone to go and do. Like a light bulb is really complicating, but all I have to do is turn on a switch and I have a light. Right. Yeah. So that is genius. Now that was the point of this is taking this genius relationship of taking a comp- something really complex relationships are hard. They take a lot of work, but they could be broken down in so small, simple, easy steps for anyone to do and make their relationship amazing. Mm-hmm. So that's where the name came from. And yeah, 
I'm you right. could go and do it too. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not an English show either, so it's one of those things where I have to make sure I'll win one too. But what could be the call to action did for the audience today? I think you should start journaling. Literally take a paper, take two markers. It's way more fun with markers than pen, two different colors, one in each hand, and then just journal something difficult, a little challenge, maybe something fun. You might like want to start by scribbling a picture, like even stick figures with your non-dominant hand about the situation, and then just ask those questions. Let me know how it goes. Yeah. That, look at that expressive language there too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. One last thing, where can people find you online? Okay, so for Genius Relationships, you want to go to GeniusRelationships.com. And social media, probably the best place is TikTok, Life Picks Relationships, or LinkedIn, Esther Rappaport. And yeah, if you I, want, oh, 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 I forgot. I was yeah. like three mini sessions. I completely <clears throat> forgot about Ooh, this because perfect. I like so love this CJA thing. And I think that once you have the tools, you could go and do it by yourself. I'm giving free mini sessions. If you want, you could go to lifepicksrelationships.as.me and book your session there and get started. I'll make sure I have the links in the description there. I didn't even know about your TikTok there. We're definitely going to talk about that here after the recording. So, but yeah, <laughs> thank you for coming on the Polymath Podcast. Thank you so much, Dustin. I really enjoyed every moment of this. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you, ST.